ready for the word? Yeah. All right, let's do it. All right. Um, let's see. It's called The Lord Our Righteousness. And uh, what I've kind of been rolling on lately is, remember the, the, the lightsaber thing here? Right, is in the Old Testament, there's these places right where it, it, there's a revelation of God, and it'll say, like what we already do, uh, Jehovah Shalom, right? The Lord is our peace. And then later on, God became a man called Jesus, and it says in Ephesians that Jesus himself is our peace, right? That extension of the Father, uh, Jesus. And then after the resurrection, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, now I send you, right? And we bring the message of peace to others, and his peace flows through us. And we also saw the same thing last week. It was in uh, the Lord is my shepherd, right? Jehovah Ra'ah. And, uh, and then uh, 800 years later about God became a man called Jesus, and he showed up in Israel and he said, I am the good shepherd, right? He was that extension of the Father. And then he also told us, right, as we become shepherded, then he also commissions us and he says, now go out and shepherd others, right? As the Father sent me, now I send you. And we are to shepherd each other and shepherd those who are new in the Lord. And, right? and so there's this kind of theme, right, that God reveals himself in the Old Testament as Jehovah whatever it may be, right? And then Jesus is that, and then uh, it extends to us. So I, I want to continue that just a little bit here. Uh, one of the verses, uh, one of the revelations there is, it's called the Lord our righteousness. And so uh, before, I, before I go to the verse, the verse is in Jeremiah, and we actually read it last week, uh, but I want to go back there. Before I go there, I guess what I want to start with, though, is the idea that the greatest need of man is the need for right standing with God. And most, most people don't recognize that as their greatest need, right? Most people, if you say, what is your greatest need? They would say food, work, clothing, housing, happiness, partner, you know, marriage, whatever, whatever it may be. People, you know, express other things as their greatest need before they would ever occur to them. That their actual greatest need is right standing before God. Amen? Because if you don't have that in the end, right, we're, you were in pretty bad shape, right? And so, uh, you know, that, that is our greatest need. Uh, and then when, when God begins to kind of reveal that to us, you know, how, as we're hearing the gospel, we're hearing the word of God, and the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us that we do need a Savior, right? That's a revelation to a lot of people. Until that, we kind of fight it, you know. But uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple of verses on that bef before we uh, move on to the actual verse I want to look at. Uh, Matthew 5.20, uh, Jesus was teaching, and he said, to this, keep in mind, again, this is before the cross, right? And he is teaching under the law, right? And many of the things Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was teaching under the law up until the cross. The cross and the resurrection, the new covenant starts at that point, right? Um, not before. So he's still teaching under old covenant, living under old covenant, and he's getting people ready for this transition. So one of the things he said is, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Well, that's a scary verse, isn't it, if you don't understand what's going on here. That's terrifying, right? Because the Pharisees were people that were holier than thou, better than us, and everything, right? They had all the rules, knew all the rules, followed all the rules, quoted all the rules. They did everything just right, and they were pretty, pretty uh, judgmental towards those who weren't doing everything right. And they were like just, you know. Uh, and so Jesus said this amazing thing. Is if, if your righteousness isn't greater than the Pharisees, you don't make it at all. <gasps> right? Help me. <laughs> well, what's he talking about? Uh, we'll, we'll keep going and see. Uh, Romans 3, 9 and 10 also, there's this verse that's actually a quote from uh, the book of Psalms. It's a quote from two different Psalms. It's repeated. And uh, basically it's talking about the fact that all people, again, need a Savior. And Paul's talking here about Jews and Gentiles, the condition of Jews versus Gentiles. Jews had the law of God, the prophets, and the covenant. Gentiles had nothing. And he said, what then? Are we Jews better than they, the Gentiles? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Jews and Gentiles, he means. And as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And that's a quote from uh, two different Psalms where it basically says, there's this long kind of monologue where it says, they're you know, they all have poison in their tongues and, you know, they're like snakes and, they, you know, no one does good, no one seeks God, no one understands, no one is righteous, you know, and it kind of describes the condition of mankind and it's a kind of depressing sort of passage there because, but it's basically God saying, this is your condition without, without right standing and it ain't good, right? So, also, what's the next one there? 
2 uh, Timothy 3.16. Uh, and and I, the reason I put this verse here is because it uses the word righteousness in a different way. And I want to make sure that we understand it really, really well. Uh, so here he says to Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So here we know that in the Bible the word righteousness is used two ways. One is your position and your standing before God. Right? And we need, when I say we need right standing before God, that's righteousness. Right? There's, it's also used in the sense of practicality. Righteousness in the practical sense is doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing, right? If you're, if you're you know, in the store and say, should I steal the candy bar or should I not steal the candy bar? Don't. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, you know, you get the idea. So in all things, righteous, practical righteousness is making the right decision. And he says the scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, right? Teaching, reproof, correction. He corrects what we, what, how we think, how we believe, all that. And for instruction in righteousness. So instruction in righteousness is a good thing, but does instruction in righteousness ever make us righteous it doesn't <laughs> it does it's a good thing but it never makes us righteous you can you can instruct in righteousness all day long the rest of your life and try and try and try and it never makes you righteous <laughs> once you become righteous then instruction in righteousness helps you live out that righteousness right and that's a good thing but but I, I want to make that clear because the two definitions of this word as they're used in the Bible, one is a standing or a position, right standing before God. Another one is practical living and decisions, right? Uh, so, but the, the scripture is very, very clear um, from what we just read and dozens of others that uh, there's none righteous, not even one. And Jesus said under the law, if your righteousness isn't way better than the Pharisees, you don't make it at all. <laughs> and what he really meant was the standard is perfection. Right? It's perfection. So, oh, all right. Well, uh, with that said, jump to uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. And we were here uh, last week when we were talking about uh, the Lord as our, our shepherd. And so, at the end of this passage, uh, the prophecy is, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Let's read verse six and then we can go back. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. We read all that to get to this. The Lord our righteousness. <laughs> the Lord our righteousness. And so this again in the Hebrew, the Lord is the word Jehovah, that name of God. That, is, that means I am. It first revealed in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses asked God, what's your name? Who are you? And God said, I am who I am. I just am. <laughs> right? I just am. And so he uses that as his name and he keeps adding stuff. So he says, this is Jehovah. I am. He is our righteousness. And so that, that word in the Hebrew there is tzedek. Jehovah tzedek. And he is the Lord, our righteousness. This is cool. If go back to verse 5 for a second here. So let's just kind of digest the prophecy a bit. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When he says that, generally he's talking about new covenant, isn't he? He's talking about after, after Christ, the cross, the resurrection, the finished work of Jesus is in place. And that's generally what he refers to with the coming days. And he says, I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. So one of the things we know is this prophecy is about a, a man who will be a physical, a physical descendant of King David. Okay? He has to be a physical descendant of David or it's not the right guy. And he's going to be called a branch of righteousness. A branch of righteousness. That's pretty cool. A king shall reign and prosper. So we know he's going to be a king, right? He seems to be a savior first and then a king in really when it's all, you know, openly manifested. But he will be a king and it says he will reign and he will prosper and he will execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. So here's the thing though again. If he says, I will raise to David, physical descendant of David, a branch of righteousness, which means that this man will be in and of himself righteous in a way that nobody else is. Because the other verse said, none is righteous, no, not one, right? And, but this man will be called the branch of righteousness. He is righteous in every way, completely, perfectly righteous, and a physical, a human being, a physical descendant of David. And he will reign, he will have a kingdom, he will right, rule. And then verse 6, again, says, in his days, 
Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. And this part of the prophecy is still to come, by the way. It's still to come. Um, because when Jesus comes back, it says in the Bible that all Israel will turn to him finally at his coming. And then they will, he will reign in Israel physically for a thousand years. And, yeah, and uh, they will embrace him as Messiah finally. And they will dwell in safety. And then it says, now this is his name by which he would be called. Whose name? The man who's a physical descendant of King David, a human being like us, who is perfectly righteous. Right? And his name is called Jehovah our righteousness. <laughs> so again, pretty plain who we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, who is Jesus? He is God. He is Jehovah. And what does he come to do? He, he doesn't come to tell us how to be righteous. He doesn't come and crack the whip and say, try harder to be righteous. He comes and he says, I am your righteousness. And that's good news. That's called the gospel. <laughs> I am your righteousness because you need it. Right? And there's no other way for you to do this. And I will be, again, so important. It's not that he teaches you how. Now, does he teach us? We read a verse a minute ago in Timothy, training in righteousness, right? So does he actually teach us about righteousness in practicality and decisions? And yes, he does. He does. But is that what makes us righteous? No, what makes us righteous is when we accept him and he is Jehovah, our righteousness. The moment you say, you are my righteousness, he says, you got it, it's in place. It's done. <laughs> now I'll teach you how to live righteously, right? But, but you are righteous now. It's yours, it's done. All right, and then uh, go to Romans 5.19. So he says, uh, Paul says, uh, I love this verse. I re every so often I read it because it makes this very, very cool point that I think is so powerful. If you haven't heard it before, you need a refresher. He's talking about uh, Adam, you know, how Adam sinned and the whole human race, well, Adam and Eve, and the whole human race became sinners because of that. We inherited this sort of spiritually genetic right, sin uh, condition and everybody became sinners. But then Jesus comes and Jesus makes us righteous. He is the Lord, our righteousness. And one of the ways that he does this, it says, for as by one man's disobedience, that would be Adam, um, and he's referring to Adam as the head of Adam and Eve here. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's true. You're, again, you know, you're not, you're not a sinner because you sin. You were a sinner because you were born descended from Adam, <laughs> right, who sinned, right? And that, that was it, right? And then it says, so also, though, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Huh, that's awesome. Well, you can say it's not, it's not fair that, you know, Adam sinned and I was born, became a sinner. You're, okay, maybe not. Um, that's how genetic diseases work, right? You're just born with it. Um, however, it's also not fair that by one man's obedience, I became righteous. <laughs> right? In either case, it wasn't about me. It was about who I'm under, right? Who's covering I'm under, right? And yeah, and who I'm connected with and identified with. And so uh, by, by Adam's disobedience, we became sinners. And then, of course, we did sin. Uh, but by one man's obedience. And here's, here's the point always, though. We tend to think, again, the religious you know, thinking is, by my obedience, I will be righteous. And the Bible says, no, impossible. In fact, it says back in Isaiah that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Right? They're like filthy garments. So here's how you become righteous. By Jesus' obedience, he lived as a man in perfect obedience to the Father in every day, every detail, every moment, right up to the cross, gave his life in perfect obedience to the Father's will. And by his obedience, you became righteous. <laughs> Not by your own obedience. Is, is, our, is our obedience good and important? Yes. At a, and that's called training in righteousness again. But that comes after. That's not how you become righteous. It's how you later on learn to live right, God's way. But by Jesus' obedience, you become righteous. How does that work again? His obedience is credited to you at right, the moment you call, and he is your righteousness. Right? Okay. Uh, whew, that's very, very cool. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is where it gets dicey. So I'll kick a sacred cow, maybe or at least challenge your thinking if you, you know. So if you, if you as a Christian with his righteousness in place and you mess up, you say the wrong thing, you do the wrong thing, you sin, you know it. You just, you just blew it. You just messed up. Are you now unrighteous? 
No. Your righteousness, your obedience didn't make you righteous, and your disobedience did not make you unrighteous. His obedience made you righteous, and as long as your faith is in him, don't take advantage of this, obviously, and people get really nervous right now, really, really nervous. Oh, oh what are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> No, don't take advantage of it. No, right? <laughs> don't go out and sin. No, there's still nothing good about sin. That's what sent Jesus to the cross, right? However, does, if you sin, if you mess up, does that make you unrighteous? It does not. His, you, he is your righteousness still. How do you get saved? Faith. How do you stay saved? Faith. Do we still learn to live righteously? Do we want training in righteousness? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But he is, our, he is our righteousness, right? And we have to believe that. We have to trust that. Amen? We really, really do. Because otherwise, if you mess up and, and anybody but me mess up once in a while, and okay, yeah, and then you're a yo-yo. Spiritually, you're a yo-yo, right? I'm unrighteous. I'm righteous. I'm unrighteous. I'm righteous. I'm unrighteous again. Well, then what did Jesus really accomplish? Right? <laughs> He is our righteousness. Now, if you understand that, though, you, what's born in you is a desire to live righteously, a desire to be like him and live like him. And, and you, do, you become, like, you don't like sin. And even if you do it, you don't like it, right? I mean, you don't, right? Yeah, and you, you want to get clean and you want to stay clean. And so, but we have to understand this thing because, again, this is a confusion in the church, you know, and uh, this, is, this is what I believe. This is what I read there. And so his obedience made me righteous. He is my righteousness, right? And that's in place. That's in place. That's good news because I don't want to be a spiritual yo-yo, right? Do I still confess if I've sinned? Do I still confess and ask God forgive? I do, I do, because I want to keep my heart tender, right? I want to keep my conscience tender with God. But, yeah, he is my righteousness. Now, <laughs> look at 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. I lose anybody? Anybody leaving the church right now? Or, yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while it happens. I mean, that, that, that one idea is so challenging for sometimes if we've been taught a different way. That one idea. And so if that's a challenging idea to you, pray and ask God. And, and, right? But let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 1.30. It says, but of him, this, this would be God the Father, by, you are now in Christ Jesus, right? You are now in Christ Jesus, who became from us wisdom from God and what else? Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Oh, cool. So the wording in this is so very, very cool again because remember like, you know, he is my peace, right? And Jehovah is my peace. Jesus is my peace. Again, it's not that he teaches me how, it's that he is my peace. And here, he is my righteousness. Not just that he teaches me how, he is my righteousness. And so now the wording here is, says, but of God's will and God's work, you are now in Christ Jesus and Jesus became to you personally. You got to make it personal. Jesus became to you personally from God righteousness <laughs> righteousness okay. so it should again question should I believe that and embrace that or should I reject that and say no that can't possibly be right, right. No, that, absolutely I embrace that I believe that that is called the gospel right he is my righteousness that's exactly the same thing we read in Jeremiah 23 he is Jehovah my righteousness okay. and he became to me righteousness again how did he do it becoming a man paying for my sins on the cross satisfying that debt with his blood with his life and then when it was canceled and paid he rose from the dead and said done right all right and so now he is righteousness to us and also jump into 2nd Corinthians 5 21 and so this uh, also, uh, same, same Paul writing to the Corinthian church again, the second time, and he explains it again. And he said, for he, meaning God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? Now, this is, this is, by the way, you know how I kind of cycle through these four things on the walls, right? I, I realize I left those up for, there for myself. Uh, what do we have? New foundations over there in the corner, right? And so, and then from new foundation, that's the gospel, right? That's the foundation of who is Jesus and what has Jesus done for us. And then over here, there's growth and discipleship. 
and on that's more kind of discipleship topics. And then we have family and relationships. And over here we have ministry and leadership. And I left those up for myself because I find that I cycle through those subjects. I, I cycle through them over and over and over again and to try to keep everybody on the same page. And so this one is new foundations. This is, this is the basic gospel. This is what Jesus did for us, right? And yet, you know, so if it's in any way new to you or any way confirming and, and strengthening your foundation, good. That's what this is for. So we want to understand the nature of righteousness, that God the Father, as Jesus was on the cross, Jesus who knew no sin, who was the branch of righteousness, right? Perfect, perfect. He made him on the cross to be sin for us. And I don't understand how that works exactly, but I know that he took all of our sin, all evil, all wickedness, all failure, all, all everything, all the consequences of the fall, and put it on Jesus in a way that Jesus absorbed it into himself somehow and then died as that. Not only died for us, but died as us, right? Absorbed all of it into himself literally became all the consequences of the fall, died as that, died for us, and then released to us in exchange the gift of righteousness, right? And it says that we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, what is it? That, that phrase even melts my brain, to become the righteousness of God. Wow, what does that even mean? Apparently, that means that God sees you as absolutely righteous in every way, and you are a representation of him in the earth, too. At least that's the plan. <laughs> that's, the, right? that's the intention. And... Huh. So, you know, there, it's kind of pre-shadowed here by, um, there's a story, I don't have it up on the screen, but it's in, it's in the Bible. Um, back when Moses was leading Israel, you know, out of Egypt and on the way to the promised land, and it said that the Israelites were complaining about, you know, they didn't like the conditions, right? You know, we don't like the food, we don't like the water, we don't like how this is going. And they complained, and, they, and it says snakes came and started biting them, and people were dying of snake bite, right? <laughs> right? You know the story, some of you. And, uh, and so, and snakes in the Bible represent demons, right? They, they represent demons. And snake bite represents the bite of sin. And so the people were complaining, and, and they're being bitten by snakes, and they're dying because they're infected by sin, symbolically here. And then they cry out to God, and Moses cries out to God, and God said, tell you what to do, right? You get, you get the bronze, this bronze uh, pole, right? And put an image of a bronze, one of those snakes, a bronze snake on this pole and lift it up. So you've got a picture a pole with a bronze serpent. And then God said this crazy thing. <laughs> the wisdom of God. He said, everybody who looks at this bronze serpent will be healed. They will not die of snake bite. They will be healed. But he said, this is what you got to do. Look at it. Gaze at it. Fix your eyes on this bronze serpent on the pole and you will be healed. That's it. I don't take pills. I don't take injections. I look at this serpent on the pole and I'm healed. That's it. And everybody who believed that and did that lived. <laughs> and of course, that's a picture of this because really what this is a picture of, bronze represents judgment in the Bible, the, the judgment of God on sin. And this, why is there a serpent? Because this pole represents the cross. Why is there a serpent? Is this supposed to represent Jesus? Was Jesus a serpent? No, absolutely not. But it said that Jesus became, he absorbed all of this into himself in a way that melts my brain and I can't even explain it. He himself without sin, but he absorbed all of our sin, died as it, died for it, right? And that's what, and that's what, and it says if we look at Jesus now, if we look at Jesus in faith, we are saved and we are being delivered from sin, amen? Yeah, being delivered from sin and we don't die of snake bite, right? <laughs> and we become, righteousness is born inside of us by nature. God clothes us in his righteousness. Jehovah God is our righteousness. Jesus Christ is himself our righteousness and he wants us to trust that and believe that. But then righteousness changes our nature. It's not just a position. It is a change that really happens in us, right? And it's progressive and it does work from the inside out, right? And I don't measure, we don't measure this is, again, my, my personal belief. I believe it's very, very scary. We don't measure righteousness by adherence to rules. Well, did you drink that? Did you touch that? Did you look at that? Did you watch that? Did you do this? Did you go there? That's not how I measure righteousness. Righteousness, practical righteousness, is being measured by the transformation of heart. Amen. If your heart is being transformed with his nature and it starts to show, that's, what we're, that's, that's the proof, right? <laughs> that's the result. Amen. Amen. And that will change behaviors, won't it? It will change our tastes and what, all those kind of things. But it's the transformation of heart that we're really looking at. Uh, so somehow, again, he made him, God, the Father made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we, so that we I like the wording, so that we might become 
that kind of sounds like, I hope it works, right? So that we might become. Here's the question. Did it work? Yes. Yeah. God didn't fail. <laughs> he didn't fail. It worked. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. <laughs> right? You are. You are. Absolutely. Whew. Hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Um, all right. So if we get that, then uh, jump to John 15, 15. I like this verse because, again, if you've been here a while, you've read this verse several hundred times. Why did God give us the gift of righteousness? Right? And we're keeping in mind, that's mankind's number one need. Absolute number one need is right standing before God. And he gave it to us. He didn't have to, but he did. He gave it to us. Why did he do it? The one reason that I know most of all is that God did it so that he could have a relationship with you. Without giving you right standing, he could not have a relationship with you. And he wanted one. <laughs> he wanted a relationship with you. And the only way to accomplish that is to give you right standing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Otherwise, it was impossible. In his justice, he could not. <laughs> but he gives you right standing. And this is a valuable gift, isn't it? This is a precious and valuable gift. This is not something we take lightly, but it is something we take seriously. It's real and it's ours and it's in place. Amen. And so, you know, Jesus said this to the disciples right before he goes to the cross. Uh, no longer do I call you servants. A servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but now I have called you friends. The most beautiful thing. There was only in the entire Old Testament, there was one guy that God called a friend. And it was Abraham, right? A man of faith. And, and so these disciples know, they know the scriptures. And when Jesus says, I call you friends, it explodes in their brain at that moment. You know, hopefully if they're conscious at all, it explodes in their brain. God only called one person a friend and that was Abraham. And Abraham was known for believing God. Amen. And Abraham is the father of all the Jewish people. And, and now Jesus says to them, he is Jehovah, our righteousness, bodily standing in front of them, about to pay for their sins on the cross. And he says, I'm doing this so that we can be friends. <laughs> doing this so we can be friends. So here's, is the gift of righteousness, here's the whole point. Is it just something so you can walk around and go, I'm righteous, I'm righteous? Or is it something so that you can go move into that relationship with God so that you can. He wants you to, right? To, to uh, purposely embrace a, right, a relationship with him that involves communication and intimacy and heart to heart, right? This is what he wants, right? So if we just receive the gift of righteousness and say, thanks for that, I'll go to heaven someday. He's like, oh no, you're missing the point here. I did this so we could have a relationship. I did this so we could be close. Will you please... Draw close and spend time with me. That's why I did this. That's what this is for, right? Come and be my friend. Come and be close. Come and satisfy my heart. Ooh. Oh, that's what this is for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In uh, John 15, still here, the same chapter, verse 7 and 8. Uh, we read this a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. One of the, I'll give you several reasons why he gave you the gift of righteousness. Um, and what do we do with this gift of righteousness? The first one, again, so we can be friends, so we can have a relationship. That's the most important. It's the biggest one. Uh, but there is, there is other reasons, and there are other, are other things that come out of this. And one of these things is prayer. If you don't really have right standing before God, prayer doesn't work so well. <laughs> you know, prayer is, you know, it's not that God rejects our prayers. It's that we don't even bother to try. You know, if you don't feel... If you don't feel you're in right relationship with God, how many want to pray, spend a lot of time in prayer? <laughs> no. How many want to run away and hide? Yeah, do something else, right? That's, that's the whole point. When God wants us to pray because prayer is the business of the kingdom. Prayer is how things change. Eh? Absolutely. And so we, we read this uh, a few weeks ago, John 15. This is where he said, I'm the, I'm the vine and you're the branches, right? And my, you connect with me and my life flows into you and flows through you. And he said things like, you know, without me, you can bear no fruit, but with me, you'll bear fruit. And then we'll do a little pruning and you, and you abide in me and my word abides in you and you'll bear much fruit. And he, and he said, he says it here, verse seven and eight. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. 
So what he's saying, after he gave the, the disciples this amazing revelation about the vine and the branches and all the understanding that goes with that about the relationship with Jesus, he's introducing them to the new covenant, right? This is how this is going to work. I'm the vine, you're the branches. We're connected. I flow into you. I flow through you. He's giving this amazing revelation. And the very next thing he says is, and a big part of this is prayer. Now you're going to pray. You're going to pray. And you're going to pray because you're abiding in me and I'm abiding in you and my word is in you and you know my will and it's, you're, you're desiring my will and you're partnering with my will and you're going to come into prayer and you're going to pray for stuff to happen and pray for stuff to change. Pray your kingdom come, your will be done. And right as you pray, that's the business of the kingdom. That's the engine room of the kingdom of God on earth is prayer. It really, really is. Right? It's where a lot of stuff has changed and victories are won in prayer before they're won any other way. And he said, so... And my father will be glorified. You'll be very fruitful. But he's talking about prayer, right? That's where things, that's where victories are won. That's where things just change, right? And people that you thought would never get saved get saved, you know? And yeah, and, and breakthroughs that you thought would never happen, they happen, right? And he says, so you'll prove to be my disciples. Prayer is a big part of that. But again, here's, here's my point. If you don't feel that you have right standing with God, how many of you are going to pray confidently? <laughs> No, <laughs> you don't pray confidently, right? If you pray at all, you pray like a beggar. If you don't know that you have right standing with God, if you pray at all, you'll pray like a beggar. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, we're unworthy, 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 Lord. But if you would just, oh, God, if you would just open one eye and blink at us. I'm making fun, but... But you, you know my point, right? If you know that God has given you right standing and calls you to prayer and you approach the throne of your father boldly, knowing that he has clothed you in righteousness, right? And he calls you to pray. Can you now pray confidently, knowing that you're in right standing? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I pray that my lost loved ones get saved in Jesus' name, right? <laughs> and I, I don't have to beg you to pay attention. I know you're paying attention. I know you're hearing me, and I'm, call, I'm calling my loved ones into salvation in Jesus' name, right? I'm calling for this breakthrough. I'm calling for this need to be met. I'm calling, right? And you can pray boldly, not arrogantly, but boldly, with confidence, right? But knowing that you have right standing, such a big part of that. Uh, I've, one of the ways I always kind of explain it is condemnation, a sense of condemnation before God will torpedo your faith every time. If you feel condemned, that feeling alone will torpedo your faith. Even if it's a lie, even if you're, you're, you're a Christian and you're clothed in his righteousness and you just don't quite understand that and you, you thought the wrong thing, you said the wrong thing, whatever, and now you feel condemned again and the devil's going, ah, you're condemned, you're condemned, you're condemned, and you're going, I know, I know. That alone torpedoes your faith. You won't pray confidently, will you? But when you know, wow, I did, I did say the wrong thing. I did do the wrong thing. God, forgive me, right? But you are my righteousness. Forgive me. I want to keep my heart tender, right? And just, you know, but I trust in you. You are my righteousness, God. Can you still go ahead and pray confidently? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. All right. Um, what else? Uh, I want to read three other verses here real quick. We're closing in, but... Three more verses that all say the same thing. 1 John 2.29. Look, look for the two word phrase that's repeated here. Uh, it says, if you know that he is righteous, Jesus, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Okay? Read the next one. It's 1 John 3.7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Okay? And the next one, 1 John 3.10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. What's the common word in all those? Practice righteousness, right? This common, common phrase, practice righteousness, practice righteousness. Three times he says it. And so, again, what's the implication here? Is he saying that if you practice righteousness, you become righteous? No, because that would be a contradiction to the entire rest of the Bible, <laughs> to the entire gospel and the finished work of Christ, and it's impossible. So he's not talking about you obtain righteousness by practicing righteousness. What he's talking about is if you are a believer and you have obtained righteousness in Christ by his finished work, and he is your righteousness, then are you going to practice righteousness increasingly as, yes. <laughs> and if you never do, and it never shows, and it's never there, something's wrong. <laughs> Something's missing. Right? Something's missing. So again, he's using this. He's saying if you see somebody practicing real righteousness, not just you know, 
you know, passing themselves off, but somebody practicing righteousness, right? Saying that's the result of the gift of righteousness and of God's nature being born inside of you and transforming you and growing on the inside of you, right? Becoming the righteousness of God in Christ. All right. Uh, I just wanted to explain that because I know uh, virtually every Christian I ever know, uh, if they ask me a question about that passage, they say, is that saying? And I have to explain, no, because then the Bible would be contradicting itself and going in a completely different direction and it's gone the rest of the time. We practice righteousness because he has given us the gift of righteousness. Yeah. But, but then we do, right? And we increasingly do. Um, and then uh, two last verses, John 20, 21. <laughs> uh, yeah, we read this the last couple of times. Do you remember this? <laughs> God is our peace. Jesus himself is our peace. And then we bring peace. And God is our shepherd. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, now go out and shepherd each other and be, be shepherds for me. Right? And here, again, Jesus said us, peace to you as the Father sent me. I send you. And we're talking about righteousness. So, yeah, what does this mean? Read the last verse for me. Psalm 22:31. Psalm 22 talks about the work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, and it describes prophetically what he's going to do for us and when he's finished. And then it says, uh, and this is speaking about us. They will come and they will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. <laughs> So he does, after he becomes our righteousness in the flesh, on the cross, and resurrection, then he says, now carry this message, carry this, right? Bring it to others. Bring it to, bring it to generation after generation after generation. That's called the gospel, isn't it? It's called the gospel. And it's good news. <laughs> it's good news. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, let's pray. Let's stand together and... Again, if you're not comfortable standing, that's perfectly okay. I just want us engaged for a few minutes here to let God do something in your heart. So this message, this is a foundational message, but every time I preach it, it's like a wedding. You know, something old, something new, something borrowed from another preacher, and something blue. Something blue means new revelation from God <laughs> to me personally. <laughs> so that's what we got. Something new, something, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Thank you, Jesus, that you are revealing to us the beautiful, beautiful work of righteousness that you accomplished on our behalf and that you give it to us as a gift Jesus, you are our righteousness. I, I just, first of all, uh, we'll take a few minutes of ministry. I want you to receive this. I want you to allow this to penetrate your thinking, your mind, your heart. So let's just start at the, start at the, the prophecy in Jeremiah 23. And will you say this with me? God, you are, God, you are. my righteousness. The Lord, my righteousness. Lord my righteousness, Jehovah God, my righteousness. And you became a man called Jesus, descendant of David, branch of righteousness, Savior and King, died for me, rose again, and you are my personal righteousness, Jesus. Now what I want to pray for, I want to pray for you that, that the Holy Spirit will give you a, a, a righteousness consciousness. It's a phrase, probably some of you have heard it, but there's, you could have a sin consciousness or you could have a righteousness consciousness. Please let this sink into your heart. What I'm saying, there's really two different mindsets you can walk in just on a normal daily basis. A sin consciousness means you're always feeling like you're a sinner. You're always feeling like you're guilty. Always feeling like you're, you're condemned. You've done the wrong thing again. You're never going to be good enough. You're trying hard, but you're never there. And that's called sin consciousness. There's another phrase called righteousness consciousness, and it means that you are very conscious on a daily basis of the fact that Jesus is your righteousness. 
and that it's absolutely in place, it's perfect, it's yours. And God sees you as righteous 24-7. Even while he's teaching us how to live righteously, he is our righteousness positionally and in every way. And righteousness consciousness means that you, you choose to believe that and you choose to let that become part of your thinking and your feeling and your self-image and, and it becomes how you relate to God. That you're just conscious of the fact, you easily remember the fact that you are righteous before God because of Jesus. And that gives you confidence in life. It gives you confidence with God. It frees you from condemnation, or at least gives you the way to fight back if condemnation attacks you. It gives you the, the absolute right, right weapon to fight back against it. It's called the breastplate of righteousness, the knowledge that you are righteous in Christ. And God wants you to have that confidence And he wants you to have peace. He wants you to know that he is looking at you. This is, this is it. Hear it. He want, God wants you to know that he is looking at you with joy, with love, and with approval. Because he is your righteousness. He did it so that he could accept you so that he could call you as a friend, call you into relationship. He, that's why he did it, and he did it right, and it's perfect. And he wants you to know that when he looks at you, he is not looking at you with anger, disappointment, or disapproval, but God is looking at you with joy, with love, with approval, with acceptance, with affection, that's how he's looking at you right now and every moment. And even when he corrects us, we, we do something wrong and he, he will correct us. But that doesn't change this. That doesn't change this. Hallelujah. So just pray a prayer with me. Simple. Mean it and then let the Holy Spirit do it. Say, God, I pray. Take out of me sin consciousness and any sense of condemnation, disapproval, rejection, or anger from you, God. Take it out of me because it's a lie. Give me instead, Holy Spirit, righteousness consciousness that you are my righteousness and I believe that I live confidently in that. I pray confidently. I spend time with you confidently. I see your face, God, with love, affection, approval, and acceptance for me. Now just let that sink in. Holy Spirit, just breathe that into people right now as they've prayed it, as they've confessed it. Holy Spirit, breathe it into them that they will live confidently in what you have done for them. <sighs> that they will value, so value the gift of righteousness. The reality of it and what it cost, but the reality of it. They will so value it that they'll be conscious of it all the time. And they will, that they will glorify you, God, by being conscious of the gift of righteousness. And that your people will not only enjoy peace and joy because of it, but they'll be able to pray confidently. They'll be able to share Jesus with other people confidently. Ooh. Holy Spirit, now more, more. Fall on us. Fall on us. Ooh. Oh, God's going to do something. Can I, can, we, can I invite you up front? 
And I'm going to invite you up front. Just, just come on up for another, just another couple of minutes of, of just group, group prayer here. I feel like the Holy Spirit just wants to increase His presence on you. Like He just wants to increase. Yeah. That manifested presence upon you right now. And He wants to just sink that into your heart and soul. And it, and it's, it's just kind of a prophetic... He can do it in the back of the room as well as the front of the room. But there's something about just getting together and being together here. And... <laughs> yeah. Come on, come on. And again, just can we... Just close our eyes and as you're coming up, just lift your hands and just receive, receive, receive right now. God, pour, 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 pour. More of your presence. More of your presence more of your love, your glory, more righteousness, consciousness, God. Setting people free right now from condemnation. Setting people free from shame, from a sense of continually being under disapproval or anything like that. God, set people free from that right now. I command that to be broken off of every person here to go in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit, pour into them righteousness, consciousness. Pour into them the reality of what you've done and the result of that. That what Jesus did, it worked. It worked. It worked. It was successful. Thank you, God. Pour in each person. Lord, that sense of intimacy, greater intimacy, greater sense of your presence, of your acceptance, of your love, and a greater sense that they can pray and do kingdom business in prayer with confidence and with faith. And a greater sense of confidence even when they, if they have the opportunity to share Jesus with someone else. Oh, thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. Let your hand be with and upon each person right now, right now, right now in Jesus' name. Ha, hey. Mm-hmm. God, we receive the continual transformation inside of us as you are making us more righteous in every way, by nature, by heart. And our thinking and our actions. But God, the gift of righteousness is in place. And God, yes, just remind every heart right now the reason you did it relationship relationship God says I just want to be close to you and I want you to be close to me it was unacceptable the separation was unacceptable I want to be close to you so if you choose the same thing it's done if you choose to be close to me says the Lord it's done come it's done do one more thing just for another moment just I want to pray for your healing I want to do that just much more often again because Jesus is our healer if there's a place in your body that's in pain or injured or wounded or afflicted in any way put your hand there or if it's just maybe if there's any kind of disease or internal thing just put your hand on your heart or your stomach either way or just yeah lay your hand on yourself for a moment and Again, some healing is instant, some healing is progressive. A lot of it's progressive. I'm going to pray for your healing. And Jesus is just going to continue to heal your bodies and your minds and bless you. So, yeah, if you just lay hands on yourself for a moment if you need a healing. Right now, Jesus, I pray you took our sickness, disease, and afflictions on the cross, Lord. And by your stripes we are healed. And I pray, Jesus, right now let your resurrection power life and healing anointing flow into people's bodies right now 
where there's injuries or wounds, where there's pain, even just parts wearing out <laughs> over the days and years of our life, God, or where there's any kind of sickness or disease. God, I pray, let your healing power and anointing flow into people's bodies right now. Be working in us, removing pain, healing diseases, cast, cast out sickness and disease, any spirit of infirmity or sickness or affliction or even death. Get out of God's people in Jesus' name now. Holy Spirit, pour resurrection life into them, healing their organs, cells, healing their body systems, healing them from wounds or injuries, healing them from tissue damage or deterioration, God. Thank you, God. We speak creative miracles, body parts to be replaced, organs to be replaced, deteriorated tissue to be replaced right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Your people are being healed by the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, and if, if something happens instantly, praise God. And I'd like to know about it. If it doesn't happen instantly, every time we pray, you know that God's healing you, though. He's touching you. If it's 5% better, 10% better, hallelujah. I keep praying. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Mm. <sighs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. Oh, breathe on us. God, we worship you. We worship you and praise you. We honor you, God. Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Jehovah Shalom, our peace. Jehovah Ra'a, our shepherd. Thank you, Jesus, right now, touching people still right now. It's healing, healing any deterioration, any woundedness, any injuries or d diseased parts of our bodies. Lord, yes, your dunamis miracle power right now at work in people. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Mm. Mm.